Good afternoon. I have to tell you, this has been an amazing, amazing experience. I cannot believe the sense of, of family and of community that can be fostered in just a few hours, in, in, in less than 24 hours. It's absolutely amazing. So thank you to Nancy and to our entire team of people for, for putting this together. This has been one of the most wonderful conferences I've ever been at. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about my most recent book. It's uh, Secret Coders. It's actually a graphic novel series. The first one was released in uh, this past September. The next one will be out this August. Now, my name is Gene. This is what I look like in, in real life. This is what I look like as a cartoon. I am a cartoonist, which means I write and draw comic books and graphic novels. I've been doing this for 20 years now. And here are some of the comics and graphic novels that I've done during those past 20 years. About four years ago, I got involved with these books right here. Now, how many of you have ever seen the show called Avatar The Last Airbender? OK. If you did not raise your hand, you should feel a little bit ashamed of yourself. But don't worry, you can find this show on DVD and on Amazon Prime. I first heard about this show from my students. I used to be a high school teacher. And during lab, when they were supposed to be working on my projects, they would be talking about things like, who do you think Aang is going to end up with? Who do you think is going to train him in his earthbending? And I'd listen. I'd feel a little bit intrigued. But then I was a teacher, so I had to just tell them, be quiet and get back to work. Uh, about a year later, I have a friend named Derek Kirk Kim. Also, he's, he's an amazing, one of the most talented cartoonists I've ever met in my entire life. He loaned me the first season of Avatar Last Airbender on DVD. And he said, this is probably the best uh, American-produced animated series ever. You've got to check it out. It was on Nickelodeon. And I said, how good could it be? It was on Nickelodeon. But then I watched it, and it really is amazing. This show is meant for kids, seven and up, but it really deals with complex issues in these very nuanced ways. Uh, a few years after Avatar The Last Airbender went off the air, Nickelodeon decided to do the sequel show called The Legend of Korra. The Legend of Korra takes place 70 years after this first show ends. So they decided to ask this comic book company called Dark Horse Comics to produce a series of graphic novels that would fill in that 70 year gap. One of the editors at Dark Horse had read some of my comics before. She called me up. She asked me if I'd be willing to write these for them, and I jumped at the chance. Like I said, I've been working on these for about four years now. These three books uh, have been out for a few years. Just this past September, the fourth book came out called Avatar the Last Airbender Smoke and Shadow. The best part of this gig is I get to call Mike DiMartino and Brian Konitzko, the two animators who created this show. And they totally call me back. <laughs> it's like we're best friends. These are not the only books that I've been working on. Uh, I am also now the writer of DC Comics Superman. I am a lifelong superhero fan. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into superhero comics later. Uh, but this was an absolute thrill. This kind of came out of left field. My agent had uh, dinner with somebody at DC, and this is what came out of it. I have no idea what they ate, but I hope they eat it again. <laughs> the best part of this gig is I get to work with an artist by the name of John Romita Jr. If you have read any superhero comics in the last 15, 20 years, you will most likely have read something by John Romita Jr. He made a name for himself in the mid-90s working on X-Men and Spider-Man and Daredevil. You know that Daredevil show on Netflix? I'm sure you've all seen it. A, a bunch of you have seen it, right? It's a great show. A little bloody, but it's great. That is largely based on the work of John Romita Jr. When I was in high school, I used to go to local comic book conventions and line up to get John Romita Jr.'s autograph. Now he and I are partners on Superman. Life is kind of weird sometimes. <laughs> Now, I'm not just a cartoonist. I am also a coder. I am a, a software programmer. I majored in computer science at UC Berkeley. After I graduated from Berkeley, I worked for a small software company for two years. They're based out of Emeryville, California, and they're called Videosoft. And then I left my job as a programmer, and I became a high school teacher. This is where I taught. This is Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. Anyone heard of Bishop O'Dowd? A few of you, more of you should have heard of Bishop O'Dowd. We're kind of famous. We're most famous for our athletics program. We have amazing basketball, football, and volleyball teams. Because I was a computer science teacher there, I largely had nothing to do with their <laughs> basketball, football, and volleyball teams. But I stayed there for 17 years. I left this past June. It was really hard to leave. I got to say, I felt like I was breaking up with somebody. I actually lost sleep and couldn't eat for several days. But what this meant was, for most of my adult life, I have either 
Uh, I've both made comics and I've either coded myself or I've taught other people how to code. However, these two worlds have largely been separate for me. You know, when I first started teaching, I would tell my students on the very first day of class that I was also a cartoonist, that I also made comic books, because I wanted to get those cool points. What I very quickly realized it is, is that it is very hard to impress teenagers that you see on a daily basis. <laughs> they did not care that I made comic books. And in fact, what they would do is they would wait until the material would get hard. So in AP Computer Science, we talk about something like recursion, very hard topic. And they would start raising their hands and asking me questions about comic books. They'd be like, Mr. Yang, who do you think would win in a fight, the Hulk or Superman? So I eventually learned I had to keep these two worlds separate, and they stayed separate for years. This past September, they finally came together with this book. Secret Coders is a joint project of mine. Uh, I, I did it with a friend of mine named Mike Holmes. I did the writing and he did the art. Mike is an amazingly, amazingly talented cartoonist. Before working with me, he worked on the Adventure Time comic book and the Bravest Warriors comic book. He has this real Saturday morning energy to what he does. And Secret Coders is a, is a project that has been on my mind for years. When I taught computer science, I used to teach in this very visual way. I do a lot of drawing on the board. And when I did it, I always thought, man, a lot of this stuff would work well in a graphic novel. So that's this graphic novel. What uh, we decided to do was we decided to structure each of the chapters in this book like one of my lessons. I start off with review of an old topic. Then I introduce a new topic, and I end with an exercise to see if the reader understands the topic that I had just introduced. Uh, the way Mike and I are talking about it is we're telling people it is a lot like Harry Potter. So you know, <laughs> you know how Harry Potter goes. Harry Potter's about, there's this group of kids, they find the secret school, the secret school teaches magic, so they learn magic and become wizards. Our book is almost the same thing. <laughs> A group of kids find their secret school. These are, these are the kids. Their names are Hopper, Annie, and Josh. Uh, this secret school, instead of teaching magic, teaches coding. So they learn coding, and they become coders. Now, if you've read Harry Potter, you know that book series, great as it is, classic as it is, has a problem. And the problem is this. You read about these kids learning magic and becoming wizards. When you go home and you try those same tricks, do you get to be a wizard? No, you do not. Our book does not have that problem. <laughs> With our book, you go home and you try those same things, you too get to be a coder. So in order to make this book, I had to dig deep. I've noticed that this is a pattern. I guess it's like a requirement that every time you come here and, produce, uh, and, and present, you have to show everybody a really embarrassing picture of yourself when you're young. So this one's mine. So in order to produce this book, I had to dig really deep. I had to dig all the way back to my fifth grade year. Fifth grade was a life-changing year for me. I know a lot of you, I, I've met our, our fifth grade teachers, you hold people's futures in your hands. Fifth grade was the year that I fell in love with comics and the year that I fell in love with coding. Let me tell you how each of these things happens. I'll start with comics. I fell in love with comics because of this book right here. This is Marvel 2 and one uh, When I was a kid, at local bookstores, they used to have these things called spinner racks. There were these wireframe racks that would carry a month's worth of comics. So you could spin them so that you could see them all. Now, one night, my mom took me to our local bookstore. I saw this issue of Marvel 2 and one sitting on that spinner rack. As soon as I saw it, I knew from the depths of who I was that I needed to own it. So I brought it up to my mom and said, Mom, from the depths of who I am, I need to own this. Will you please buy it for me? She took one look at this cover and she said, no, absolutely not. Those two characters look way too scary and they're gonna give you nightmares. And she had a point because even though I was in fifth grade, I was still getting nightmares. She made me put this back. And to this day, I have no idea what the story is. I have to tell you though, full disclosure, uh, a student of mine came to one of my book talks and I talked about this and for Christmas that year, he bought me this issue. But I haven't read it yet because it ruins that joke. <laughs> now, um, now my mom, my mom made me put things back but she felt sorry for me so she bought me a comic. She bought me the latest Superman comic. Even though I'm a Superman writer now, I was not a Superman fan when I was a kid. I thought he was kind of boring. And that's exactly why my mom chose this comic for me, right? 
because Superman is boring. He's like every parent's favorite superhero. He always does the right thing. He never says any bad words. He doesn't look scary at all. He's actually kind of good looking. He looks like your favorite uncle. He flies around in this blue uniform doing good. He's like this giant flying boy scout. <laughs> I brought this home. I read it. And in this book, the atomic bomb drops in 1986. It kills off most of the world's population. The few remnants of humanity that are left, they gather themselves in these little villages that are pretty lawless. So a group of men have to get together, dress up in medieval style armor, and ride around the countryside on these giant mutated dogs to fight crime. This book terrified me. <laughs> I stayed up nights thinking about, thinking about the bomb, thinking about Superman, thinking about atomic nights, and thinking about comic books, about how this combination of words and pictures did something inside my brain that had never been done before. Pretty soon after that, I went from being a comic book reader to a comic book creator. I had this friend in, in, uh, in fifth grade. He was this half Jewish, half Japanese kid named Jeremy Kaniyoshi. And he was already a veteran comic book geek. He'd been collecting since he was in kindergarten. So he had boxes of comics underneath his bed. Uh, together, we started making comics. We would brainstorm the stories together at the lunch tables while our more athletic friends were playing kickball. And then I would do all the pencils, he would do all the inks. We'd give our originals to his mom, who would take him to work, wait till all her coworkers went home, and sneak photocopies for us. <laughs> we would take these photocopies, we'd staple them by hand, we'd sell them to our classmates for 50 cents a piece. At the end of the day, we made $8. It was awesome. <laughs> and when I was a kid, you know, at, during after school cartoons, they used to run these ads about how the Statue of Liberty was going through some issues, like her nose was about to rust off. Uh, she was in bad, just in bad shape. They'd ask for donations. Jeremy and I, we love America. So we decided to donate our $8 to the Restore the Statue of Liberty Fund. Our teacher was so proud of us that she gave us these McDonald's gift certificates that were worth more than $8. <laughs> to this day, I think that was my best financial decision ever as a cartoonist. <laughs> So that's how I got started with my love of comics. I, st I started loving coding at around the same time. The summer after my fifth grade year was amazing. It started in an amazing way. I spent every day in front of the television. I'd watch Voltron reruns and reading Rainbow, but I wouldn't read any of the books that they talked about. <laughs> my mom watched me do this, and she was just kind of disgusted. So she signed me up for these summer enrichment classes. She signed me up for four of them. Uh, now, 30 years later, I only remember one. I only remember the introduction to computer programming course that was taught on this computer right here. Now, I know some of you, you're under the age of 30, you're looking at this going, wow, is that a futuristic toaster? No. <laughs> this is an early computer. Uh, you can still find it in tech museums nowadays. Uh, this was, like by today's standards, this computer was, was kind of a joke. It, it didn't go very fast. It couldn't store anything because there was no hard drive. It used floppy disks that were actually floppy, like you could flop them around. It could only display one color. It could only display green. But I still love this machine. I still have this deep emotional attachment to it because this is the machine that I learned how to code on. Uh, the language that we learned that summer is called Logo. Logo is largely a forgotten language these days, but if you learn how to code in elementary school during the 70s or 80s, you most likely learned Logo. The best part about Logo is there's this little turtle. But the turtle didn't normally look like this. It looked like this, because graphics in the 80s were just not good. What you could do in Logo, and what we'll do at the end of this presentation, is you could give this little logo turtle these commands, and it would move around the screen and draw stuff. You could do really simple designs like this. You could combine simple designs into more complex designs like this. This is shown on a later uh, computer, which is why they're multiple colors and not just green. And you can even do these beautiful geometric designs like this. By the end of that summer enrichment class, I had fallen in love with coding. I somehow convinced my parents to buy an Apple II computer for us at home. I think I made some kind of educational argument about it, and they totally did, and I continued to code. So Secret Coders is these two worlds finally coming together for me. In order to make this book, though, I had to do a little bit of research. I wanted to use Logo in this book. I wanted to use it even though it's largely a forgotten language, but I wanted to use it because it was a forgotten language. I wanted to draw that parallel between my book and Harry Potter, 
really between coding and magic. So if you think about magic, the way magic usually works in books is somebody says something in an archaic, forgotten language, and then something amazing happens. And that really is what coding is like. Somebody says something in this archaic language, and something amazing happens. So that's what happens in our book. Our book, in our book, the, our main characters learn this archaic language that nobody remembers called logo, and when they say those words, amazing things happen. I looked into the, the history of Logo, and what I discovered was it was created in the 1960s by three computer scientists, Seymour Papert, Wally Furzig, and Cynthia Solomon. And the guy on the left here, Seymour Papert, is kind of a computer science legend. He's, he's a big, big deal. He was uh, interested in not just computer science, he was also interested in the way kids learn. He had a lot of ideas about how to educate kids. And in fact, he was later hired by Logo, I'm sorry, not Logo, Lego, <laughs> and he helped Lego develop their Mindstorms products. Mindstorms takes its name from a book that Seymour Papert wrote called Mindstorms. This is a book about educational theory. He, he, uh, he came up with and argued for an educational theory called constructionism, which came out of constructivism. So if you're, super, like if you're a super teacher nerd, you'll know what I'm talking about. What Seymour Papper believed was teachers cannot transmit concepts from their brain into their students' brains directly. That what you have to do as a teacher is you have to help your students reconstruct that same concept, and the raw materials for that reconstruction isn't necessarily going to be the same as the raw materials that you used for yours. So you are really aiding your students in doing something very creative just by the simple act of teaching. He also believed that the best way of teaching is to help your kids make stuff. He really believed in learning through making. And that's what this book is all about. It's, it's kind of an old book, it's out of print. You can still find it on eBay. If you're interested at all in educational theory, I would highly, highly recommend it. So let me tell you a little bit more about my main characters, Hopper, Annie, and Josh. Each of these kids, each of these characters is inspired by a real world person. Hopper, my main main character, is inspired by one of the most famous and important coders in the history of coding, a woman by the name of Grace Murray Hopper. Grace Murray Hopper fundamentally changed the way human beings interact with machines. He, she fundamentally changed the way we as human beings create computer programs. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about her I I in a bit. But uh, it was important for me to have my main character be a, a young girl because people don't realize this, but in the early days of computer science, Programming was considered a woman's profession. The very first uh, programmer was a woman. She was an uh, English mathematician by the name of Ada Lovelace. And early on, almost all the programmers in the world were women. This is not for very good reasons. This is because back in the day when people looked at the computer, they thought the hardware, that's the important part. So we're going to let the men work on that. But the software, not quite as important. We're going to let the women do that. Nowadays, we know differently. Nowadays, we know that the software is at least, if not more important than the hardware. But the result of this is what we think of as coding, what we think of as software development is a discipline built on a foundation laid by women. I wanted to acknowledge that history by having a young woman as my main, main character. Thank you. Now, Hopper's best friend is a kid named Eni. Eni is really good at two things. He's really good at basketball, and he's really good at coding. Eni also has a real world inspiration, and that's this guy right here. Anyone know who this is? Somebody yell it out. Somebody knows. It's Chris Bosch. He plays for the Miami Heat. He's one of the best basketball players walking on the planet today. He has won two championship rings. What a lot of people don't realize, even NBA fans, even Miami Heat fans, is that Chris Bosch is not just a basketball player. He is also a nerd. <laughs> his mom was a systems analyst, his dad was an engineer. When he was in high school, he wasn't just on the varsity basketball team, he was also a mathlete. He was also on the, in the math club, and he was in the National Honor Society. He loves math, he loves computers. When he got into college, he had planned on majoring in something computer related. He was gonna major in computer imaging and graphic design, but then he got so good at basketball that he had to leave for the NBA. But even now, even though he's an incredibly successful professional athlete, he takes a lot of the money that he earns in the NBA and he invests it in computer companies because he loves computers so much. 
a lot of people, especially kids, especially as they get into late elementary school, they think of sports and school or coding and math as these two separate things, but they're really not. There are plenty of people who are good at both and who love both, people like Chris Bosch. The last of my main characters is a kid named Josh. Josh starts off as an antagonist. In the first book, he's really mean to Hopper and Annie. He's kind of a jerk. But then when we get into book two, he becomes a true friend to them. Josh is based on uh, a real life jerk that I know, my brother-in-law, Louis. <laughs> That's what he looks like. Now, Louis and I, I gotta admit, we're, we're good friends, but he likes to make fun of me. So I really wanted to make a jerk character that, that was based on him. Lewis is not a coder. Lewis is actually a surgeon, but he loves coding. He loves computers. I don't know why he didn't go into computers. This is how he spends his day. By day, Lewis goes to his hospital. He opens up his patients, and he works on them. And then after work, he goes home, and for fun, he opens up computers, and he works on them. He loves computers so much, I'm not sure why he didn't get into computers, but he does make a pretty good living as a surgeon. Lewis also has the pointiest nose of any Asian I know. <laughs> so I wanted to make a pointy-nosed Asian character that's based on him. <laughs> Secret Coders is all about computer programming, and that's kind of what I want to do to you, with you today. I want to teach you about computer programming. I want to do it with the book and with some uh, related activities. I'm hoping that this will interest you in not just learning about coding yourself, but also maybe teaching your kids and your students a little bit about coding. Let's start with this. Coding is also called computer programming. What exactly is computer programming? Well, simply put, programming is just writing a list of instructions for a computer. It's just telling a computer what to do. That's why they say bossy people make the best coders. You're constantly telling something what to do. The process of coding kind of looks like this. A coder will take an idea, sometimes it's her own idea, sometimes it's an idea of her bosses, and she will translate that idea into a list of instructions meant for a computer. But there is a problem with this process, and the problem is this. The coder usually speaks English or some other human language, and the computer does not. The only values that a computer can really understand deep down inside are one and zero. Computers only speak in a language of ones and zeros. So then what do you write this list of instructions in? In the early days of coding, this list of instructions would be written in ones and zeros. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine doing that? One, zero, zero, one, 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 zero. It was a really difficult and kind of terrible job. Then along comes Grace Hopper, and this is how she fundamentally changed the way human beings interact with computers. She came up with a brand new process for creating computer code. Here's what she did. So you still have a coder, you still have a computer, you still have the idea. The coder still translates that idea into a list of instructions, but now this list of instructions is written in an English-like language. Not English, but English-like enough that a human being can read it and understand it. Then this list of instructions is put through what's called a compiler or an interpreter. This is a piece of software invented by Grace Hopper. And this compiler translates that list of instructions that a human can read into a list of instructions in ones and zeros meant for a computer. So with this brand new process that Grace Hopper invented, both the coder and the computer are happy. Without Grace Hopper, we would not be able to have the level of complexity in our software that we have today. She fundamentally changed things for the entire world. Now, this first list of instructions, the one written in an English-like language, that's usually called source code. The second one is usually called object code. When you go to the store and you buy a piece of software off the shelf, you are buying that object code. You're buying a list of instructions meant for the computer. Any ideas how you could see the source code? Let's say you wanted to see the source code for Microsoft Word. Any ideas how you would do it? Well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell you because none of you are raising your hand. <laughs> there are only two ways of doing it. Number one is you go and apply for a job at Microsoft and they put you on the team that is in charge of Word. The second way of doing it is you dress up like a ninja and you break into the Microsoft offices. <laughs> the, reason that, the reason it's hard to get to source code is that com companies are very protective of it. If you got a copy of Microsoft Word, you could release uh, a version of, uh, of Microsoft Word, just change a few things, and you could release a, competitive, uh, a competitor's product. They do not want that. So what coders create is actually intensely, intensely valuable.
Let's talk a little bit about the object code. This is the, uh, the, the list of instructions that that's written in ones and zeros. This language of ones and zeros is sometimes called binary. It's called binary because bi means two, like a bicycle has two wheels. You all know this. Uh, binary only has two values. Anyone know how to read binary? Just a few of you. Well, by the end of this presentation, all of you in this room are going to need to know how to read binary because I'm going to teach you right now. Let's talk a little bit about how binary works. OK, any ideas what 0101 means in binary? Somebody want to raise your hand? What do you think? What do you think? OK, five. So some people know. Those of you who, are not, who don't know binary, you're probably thinking, what? But it does mean five. One zero zero, one zero, zero, zero means 1,000 to normal people. But in binary, it means eight. And 1100 zero, zero, in binary means 12. If you don't know how to read binary, right now you're going, what is going on? This is a topic that I cover in the first volume of Secret Coders. In that first volume, Mike and I have these birds that are called binary birds. This is what they look like. And in one scene, a binary bird sees Hopper's seven-shaped earring. Hopper wears seven-shaped earrings because she's also a basketball player, and that is her jersey number. And after the bird sees this, it does this with its eyes. It opens three eyes. Hopper's kind of freaked out. Birds are not supposed to have three eyes. She asks her friend, Annie, about it. And Annie explains, these birds are robots, and their eyes display binary numbers. Hopper says, what are you talking about? And he goes on to say, binary is how computers store numbers. Every computer has these, they're like switches that can be on or off. A number is stored as a sequence of on and off switches, or in the bird's case, open and closed eyes. And Hopper says, you make no sense. So Annie says, take these seven pennies. Let's play a game. This game that they play in the book, we are going to play right now. So pay attention to the rules. I'm going to draw the board right here. Hopper asks, you always carry pennies and chalk in your pocket? And then he says, Shh, I'm concentrating on my drawing. Now look, I've got four columns of boxes here. The first column has eight boxes, then four, then two, and then one. I want you to fit all seven of those pennies into these boxes, but there's a catch. When you're done, every column has to be either completely full or completely empty. No half-filled columns. And there is only one solution. So let's try playing this game. I have up here, so right here on this table, I have a worksheet. This is from my website, secret-coders.com. This is the game board that any draws in the book. And I also have seven pennies. Does anyone think they could fit those seven pennies into those boxes, and when you're done, no half-filled columns? Anyone think they could do it? Does somebody want to try it? Would you like to try it? Come on up. In the black? Yeah. All right, let's give Monica a round of applause. Now take a look at this board. Are there any half-filled columns? No, so Monica did it right. In this game, every empty column represents a zero in binary. Every full column represents a one. So in binary, seven is zero, one, one, one. Does that make sense? Let's try one more number. I am now going to add three pennies to the board. Does somebody want to try 10 pennies? Somebody want to give it a try? Come on, be brave, be brave, be brave, Adam. All right, let's give Adam a round of applause. You see how easy binary is? So again, no half-filled columns. Adam did it right. And if you take a look at this, you can see that in binary, 10 is 1, 0, 1, 0. Make sense? So in the book, Hopper comes up with the same solution that Monica came up with for 7. And she realizes that 7 and 0, 1, 1, 1, or off, on, 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 or the, in the case of the bird's eyes, closed, open, open, open are all actually the same thing. So that bird really was showing seven with its eyes. Now, uh, I told you about the turtle already, that logo turtle. I love that logo turtle so much that I wanted to include it in the book. In the book, it doesn't look like this. In the book, it looks like this. It's a little robot turtle. And there is this one scene where Hopper and Annie 
actually experiment with this little robot turtle by giving it different logo commands. And by giving it different logo commands, they're able to make the turtle move. I'm going to show you that you can actually do this right here with a modern computer in this era. Uh, there are three different commands that are used in the book, forward, left, and right. And the way they work is this. Every one of these commands has to be followed by a number. With forward, you give it a number that tells it how many steps to move forward. If you give it 10, it'll move just a little bit. You give it a bigger number, it'll move a lot. With left and right, you give it the angle of the turn. 90, of course, is a direct turn. Now, Logo is an old language, but you can still download a version of it that'll work on a modern computer. My favorite version is called UCB Logo. I like it for two reasons. Number one, it is free. And number two, it was developed at Cal, where I got my undergraduate degree. Uh, if you want to download it, there is a, a, a URL right there. Don't worry about copying it down if you're interested. Um, I, I can give it to you on my website. So let, let me show you what it looks like. This is what Logo looks like on a modern computer. And this is an exercise that I do with kids just to get them interested in coding. So I'm going to type in forward 100. And you can see it makes a line, right? Now, let's say I want to make a square. How, what would the next line be? Any ideas? So you want to re go ahead. Write 90. So I'm going to say write 90. And the line after that, go ahead. Forward 100. And then I'm going to say write 90 again, forward 100 again, write 90 again, and forward 100 again. And there we have a square. Is that exciting? <laughs> it's only modestly exciting. But let, let, me note, let, me tell you, let, let me have you notice something. Notice that to create that square, we ended up having to type in the same lines over and over again. Anytime you repeat yourself in coding, there is an easier way of doing things. And the easier way in Logo is you can use a command called repeat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the exact same thing I just did, but I'm going to do it all in one line using a repeat. I'm going to say repeat four, forward 100, right 90. And you can see one line makes that same square. Now, check this out. I'm going to type in one more piece of code, but this time I'm going to put in two repeat statements. See if you can figure out what's going to happen on the screen. So repeat 36, repeat 4, forward 100, write 90, write 10. Any ideas? Repeat 36, repeat 4, forward 100, write 90, write 10. Somebody want to take a guess? Maybe a square, maybe a star. Lots of squares. OK, here we go. I'm going to hit return. That's what you get. So what are you looking at right now? What you're looking at is 36 squares arranged in a circle. This is why I fell in love with coding. What I realized was that coding can make art. And I've always been interested in art. And I would argue that coding, by learning coding, you can make yourself a little bit better as an artist. Not just because you can make things appear on the screen, but because coding actually teaches you to think in a certain way that can be applied to any sort of discipline that you want. So this is why I fell in love with coding. If you're interested in any of these activities, you can find them on my website, secret-coders.com. You can also find an STL file. If you have access to a 3D printer, you can print this guy out. This was actually designed by my kid. I, I have a, uh, an 11-year-old at home. And, uh, and one summer, I said, you know, uh, he really wanted Super Smash Brothers. And I said, I will buy you Super Smash Brothers if you can design for me a little robot turtle figurine. And I thought he wouldn't be able to do it. I thought he'd spend all summer on it. I thought, you'll be able to learn something at least. He did it in 24 hours. <laughs> he really wanted Super Smash Brothers. At the beginning of this decade, a study was done about computer science education in America. And what they found was uh, computer science education in America was actually in decline. At that time, they found from 2003 to 2009, the number of high school introductory computer science courses actually went down by 18%. The number of AP classes went down by 30%. College Board, the, the, the organization that administers the AP tests, uh, originally offered two different computer science tests. They offered an easier one and a more difficult one. The demand for the more difficult one got so soft that they canceled it. They no longer offer it. A lot of computer science educators saw these statistics come out, and they freaked out. And since then, we have seen this huge emphasis on STEM, right? on science, technology, engineering, and math. This has been going on for about half a decade at least. And I think nowadays, we are starting to see some pushback on this emphasis on STEM. 
A lot of people believe that some schools, at least, are emphasizing STEM at the expense of art, at the expense of the humanities. But I really believe that that is the wrong way to think about things, these things. There is no wall between STEM and art. Because you can use STEM to make art. And you can also use art to teach STEM. This was Louis Papert, uh, Seymour Papert's idea when he created Logo with his team. This is also the idea that Mike and I are playing with, uh, with secret coders. Now, uh, this past January, this crazy thing happened to me. I was invited to Washington, D.C., and the Library of Congress appointed me the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. This is a position I'll be holding for two years. It was a fancy, fancy day. They gave me a fancy, fancy uh, medal. We had a fancy, fancy lunch with a lot, lots of people wearing fancy, fancy clothes. And what, one of the tasks that I had to do as a national ambassador was I had to come up with a platform. I had to come up with something to talk about over the next two years. This is something that I created with the help of my publisher and with the help of the Library of Congress and the Children's Book Council. The platform that we decided on was reading without walls. We want to encourage kids to explore the world through reading, to break down those walls that might divide things that don't necessarily need to be divided. Thanks. So these walls, these walls include walls that separate communities, walls that separate cultures, walls that separate formats, you know, like prose, and, and novels and verse and graphic novels and picture books. And it also includes walls that separate topics. Topics like STEM and art. These two things do not need to be separate. They can reinforce each other. Again, you can use STEM to create art and you can use art to teach STEM. So I'd encourage you all, I encourage all of us to break down people's walls through reading. I know that's something that you all as educators, as, as teachers, and as librarians do on a daily basis, and I want to encourage you to continue to do what you're so good at doing. Thank you so much for this time. It was a pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you.